It's episode 154 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Go visit hankgarner.com and browse through all of the archives of the show. Be sure to subscribe while you're there over in the right-hand sidebar. There's uh, lots of episodes to go back and listen to. Get yourself up to speed and get some motivation for this new year. I'd like to tell you about some sponsors this week. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. My good friend Daniel Arthur Smith is the curator and the uh, genius behind this series. Uh, The newest episode out so far is Tales from the Canyons of the Damned in Space, Volume 1. Four authors, excellent stories, pulpy goodness with a space setting. Uh, There's another Uh, episode of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned in Space coming soon, and you won't want to miss that. Click on the link in the show notes. There's a banner there where you can pick up the whole series. If you loved reading pulp magazines and comics when you were a kid, this will definitely bring back those memories. Also, thirdscribe.com. If you're an author and you're looking for a way to connect with readers, or maybe you're a reader and you're looking for a way to find new authors or maybe connect with authors that you love, thirdscribe.com is the place to do that. Go visit Rob and the folks and let them show you how readers and writers can truly come together. Also, Nick Cole uh, brings his awesome book, Fight the Rooster, to us this week. Uh, Challenger for best read of the year. Well worth a look. Amazing job, says Tim Ward, Hugo nominated reviewer and uh, host of the Sci Fi Podcast. It's the story of one man's attempt to ruin his career in order to save his life. Part Catch 22, part the player. Fight the Rooster is an eclectic, funny, and unpredictable thrill ride through life and Hollywood. Now stay tuned for this spot from Eric Totsi and his book, The Scout. Change is inevitable. It's heading for Earth at 12,000 miles per hour, and it will land virtually undetected. For Jack McAllister, a young writer who has finally launched a career for himself, it begins tragically. His estranged father, a former NASA engineer, dies suddenly at his home in Meriwether, Indiana, leaving Jack's Alzheimer-stricken mother a widow. But in the wake of personal heartbreak, he's confronted by an even more astonishing event. The covert landing of an alien machine in the forest just a few miles outside of town. Now Jack must unmask the true purpose of the otherworldly device that has begun a detailed environmental survey of the woods. Aided by the town's young and resilient female deputy sheriff, he soon discovers that the alien scout is only one small part of a much larger operation and the countdown to a terrifying global catastrophe is about to take place. Drawing deeply from his father's scientific influence, Jack uncovers and ultimately finds himself an unwilling component of an alien plan set to terminate life on Earth as we know it. Crichton-esque techno-thriller with enough twists and turns to keep you turning those pages. The rural setting and the believable character set this apart from the majority of alien invasion novels. Sci-Fi365.net The Scout by Eric Totsi, now available at Amazon.com Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I have Danielle Girard with me on the show, and uh, Danielle writes uh, these awesome thriller, police procedural uh, books full of scary goodness. Uh, and uh, I, I I reached out to Danielle, and she was uh, gracious enough to share some time with us today. So welcome to the show, Danielle. Hank, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, well, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I, as a kid, I wasn't, you know, wasn't one of those, you know, people who had a fabulous idea when she was in kindergarten. I, I don't remember really wanting to be a writer until I was working in finance. That'll make anyone want to be a writer. Um, in <laughs> right. Right, right out of, um, college. And I met a woman who wrote romance novels, my first job, and I was so enthralled. It was almost like I'd never even imagined that one could actually be a writer. And I right. just pestered her no end about how she started and what she did. And she said, 
you know, just go put your butt in the chair and write something. And I did that. And um, on page five, somebody died. And she said, wow, well, you're not writing romance. Um, and it sort of has been that way ever <laughs> since. Um, that's really my first memory. And I must have been, you know, 22, 23. Wow. Um, Diana Gabaldon uh, was on the show one time, and she she told the story about uh, the one day when she realized that, that there were people behind the books that right. she loved. Like, you know, just, I, I guess until then it was just magic. They just I, showed up, and, you know, sort of but, I, but there I were actually love, people yeah, that did Diana, it. I love Diana, and I think she's dead on. I, and it seems so silly because I was in my 20s. It's almost embarrassing, right? But, um, but also, you know, my parents are very practical. My dad... Um, was a physician and my mom was uh, one of the first women to graduate from Stanford's business school. So they were very practical and I'm first born. So I was, you know, it was either business or medicine and I sort of did both. Um, I applied to medical school and then I went into finance and I spent 10 years there. It was writing as a career art kind of in any form was something other people could do that we could appreciate, not something that we were supposed to do. And not, you know, not to, not to criticize the way that I was raised. It just, I think we didn't ever, it wasn't really something they thought about us doing. So they were practical. Gotcha. Um, on your website, you tell this great story uh, on your about page uh, about when you were a kid and uh, you had this uh, this scary incident uh, right. in your bedroom. Right. Uh, what what uh, what happened there? Well, you know, I I, I have from birth been a worst case scenario thinker. I have I'm always I always have the sort of boogeyman um, dreams, and I you know I'm always checking under the bed and. But I think I do remember being a kid and it was in our first house. Um, so I would have been, you know, somewhere between, you know, eight and, you know, six and 11 or 12. I think it was, I remember being about eight or 10 and feeling like um, there was, you know, you'd wake up in the middle of the night with a sense that somebody was watching you and you, you know, I'd look up into the room and there was this like hooded figure, you know, standing by the, the closet door and it would freak me out and you know, sort of like sit there rigid and terrified and all of a sudden you realize it was something hanging you know it was a, a robe hanging on the uh, on a hook or you know it, it my imagination always made um and it probably still does something of nothing um and I think that's so when I started to write of course that was the natural inclination was to make something of nothing yeah. Well, that's a that's a very writerly thing to do to right. uh, to see something uh, mundane and create you know another world around it. Right, and for me, it's always a terrifying one. So that's, <laughs> that's the nature. <laughs> Uh, what is uh, were you uh, were you into uh, like scary horror uh, thriller type books uh, when you were younger? You know, so I, um, I was, and I read obviously, you know, Agatha Christie and the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. I actually like the Hardy Boys better than than Nancy Drew, but um, no, not scary stuff. And in fact, I still don't. I really can't. I hate scary movies. I um, and people compared my first book to Silence of the Lambs, which I thought was really crazy because I never made it through that movie. I had to leave midway. It was just too terrifying. And I even, you know, Dean Koontz has a lot of. Um, I've never read, I've never made it through a Stephen King book. And Dean Koontz has a lot of books that are kind of creepy, not quite Stephen King-esque. But I, I, I can barely get through some of those that are, you know, not so horrifying. So, no, I'm not a, I think almost because my imagination is so dark, it's almost too much to try to read something that's dark. Does that make sense? <laughs> It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, I am the same way. Oh, I yeah. despise horror movies. I, I just I don't like it. I don't like that feeling of being scared and terrified. Exactly. Uh, but then I, I I wrote a book last year that had some really really dark uh, parts about it, and I and I got to I was sitting there in front of my keyboard, and I was like, my God, where did that come from? Yeah, exactly. and um, it, yeah, and it's it's. Uh, it's this weird catharsis, uh, almost that, uh, that the things that you don't like when, when you're telling the story, it's, it comes from a different place. I don't, I don't quite get it. Um, 
But uh, my oldest son, who's 21, uh, read The Shining, and he finished it last night. We were just talking about it a few minutes ago. Oh, my God. And, uh, and he, he said um, – he said, I was terrified. I couldn't sleep last night. He said, but when you peel back that stuff, it's the story of the human condition and right. kind of where we all could go if we're not, uh, you know, if we're not careful. Well, and I yeah, guess that's, that's what. That's the magic of Stephen King is that he's so good at the, at the people part of it that it, it becomes universal, even though it's so far out there. You know, he, right. he's an amazing story, storyteller for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you when you kind of got that eye opening experience that okay, this is something that people do and something that that maybe I could do. Um, how did you start uh, pursuing? So I really that was I was working in finance, um, and actually my husband and I, we were living in Ohio at the time, Cincinnati, Ohio, and I um, he worked in hotel management, so he had crazy hours, um, and so I basically we didn't have kids, uh, we were just married. And I just wrote when he was at work. So I, I spent a lot of time in front of one of those old sort of block Macs, you know, back in the day when they were brand new. Um, right. And I just, you know, I did what every writer did. I wrote, you know, does. And yeah, I wrote books and I sent them out and I gathered rejection letters. And then I buried the book <laughs> and I got a second one. I did that, you know, for, I guess it's four books. I sold my four book. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, I think it's probably good to have had the experience of I have a lot, lot of rejection letters in my drawer. I actually, you know, you still get them, um, which is, you know, you think, oh, you're, you've published 10 books. You know, you must not get rejection letters anymore, but that is not true. <laughs> I still get them. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it was a wonderful thing and it made sense. Like when I, when the books that sold, sold, I thought, okay, I get it. You know, and, and now I understand, you know, 10 books in, of course, it just, it's the 10,000 hour thing. And I, I say that a lot, but I, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the Malcolm Gladwell's um, it's 10,000 sure. hours to become really an expert at something and, um, and maybe more, but I believe it. I think every book gets better. I think you learn more. I think, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way, you know, as a, an author of multiple books. Just better, smarter, um, you have more depth as you write, so you just got to keep writing. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm I'm always fascinated by the uh, the tenacious spirit uh, of writers that uh, when we start racking up those rejections uh, and and you just keep writing like there's there's never a time or there, there have been a few people that I've talked to that uh, that have said you know uh, I finally just gave up and then as soon as I gave up things started happening uh, so that's that's a, a that's a, a different mindset but. Um, yeah, the majority of people just, you know, they, they take that novel, they stick it in a drawer, and they start writing another one. And uh, the the idea that this is something that I could just walk away from uh, is really not an option. No. I mean, I did take a year off. I took a year off at one point, um, and I think it was good for me. I, you know, I, I went and did some, some marketing writing and that kind of thing. You know, when I published my first book, and, you know, I'd already, of course, written three, and I had, I'm sure... 70 or 80 rejection letters of the, I don't know, 200 and something I have now. But um, my dad gave me a pen and he had engraved on it um, perseverance of purpose, which is the last thing that Thomas Jefferson said to Mary Weather Lewis as they were taking off for their trek across, um, you know, the area where I am now, actually. But uh, and it's, I think that's what it takes. I think you have to really, pers- if you, you want to be a novelist, I think the people who, who quit are the ones, you know, that's the only way you know you'll never make it. You just, if you want to make it, the first rule is you can't quit. You have to keep writing. Um, and you have to write through the rejections. It's hard. I mean, they're, they're personal. The books are like babies. It stings. But in the end, you know, a bottle of wine and a pint of Ben and Jerry's and you just have to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my rule. Oh, anyway. so- Right, right. Uh, so tell me about that that fourth book that you wrote uh, that you sold and uh, and became your first published book. Yeah, that was Savage Art, um, and you know that um, that I pu- uh, was published by Penguin Putnam, um, and it was a book of uh, actually the story of a uh, FBI profiler who was attacked by the serial killer that she was profiling, and he 
sort of visioned himself as a Leonardo da Vinci, and he dissected people as a way of understanding them, children mostly. And this was before I had children. I think, as you said, we sort of investigate the dark places for is a, a catharsis for working out worst fears. And I think for me that was, right. as in, you know, imagining being a mother, becoming a mother, it was like the worst fear would be that something happened to your child. And so that was what I wrote right. about. And she she went to the San Francisco Bay Area um, to sort of recover and, you know, she had to do physical therapy. She, he actually dissected her hand because as a police officer, of course, that's the thing you'd use, you know, that you need those, right? Your gun, your everything. Right. So she, when she got to the Bay Area, she couldn't button her pants. She couldn't, you know, she couldn't do anything. And she had a nurse, a full-time nurse, and she was a very grouchy person. Um, and the serial killer followed her there. And that the story is of, you know, working through her, her worst fears and without the tools that, you know, she had become accustomed to, which is, you know, obviously the ability to use her hands and her weapon. Um and that was the book that people compared to Silence of the Limbs, which was a strange comparison for me. But, um, but that was, and that was sort of it. That was the, my launch into dark, dark fiction. And those were the first four books I wrote were standalone novels, um, all set in the Bay Area, all featuring a strong uh, protagonist in law enforcement. And then I, and my fifth book, which was also with Penguin Putnam, was the launch of the Rookie Club series. Um, that book was originally called The Rookie Club, and is now called Dead Center because um, Penguin Putnam and I didn't quite see eye to eye on how that would go. They, the series idea didn't um, intrigue them as much as it intrigued me. So we went after that and I did those other four rookie clubs, so there's five in total, on my own. I self-published those. Um, and then um, the fifth rookie club book uh, is, has the spinoff, which becomes the Dr. Schertzman series. Dr. Schwartzman, Dr. Annabelle Schwartzman, who is a medical examiner, she's featured in book five of the Rookie Club series, which is called Everything to Lose. And then Exhume, which was published by Thomas and Mercer in October, is the first book of that series. So that's sort of the, awesome. that's the ten books there in, in sort of summary. And uh, and you have this, uh, this common thread running through uh, the whole series, uh, which is, which is cool. Um, but if, as someone who was trained and, and working in finance, uh, how do you wind up with police procedurals and this very uh, uh, this great detail uh, that you put into your books? And Dead Center is the book that, that I first read of yours. And uh, yeah, I was not convinced uh, that you did not work in law enforcement no, uh, you know, at, at first. Yeah. So so how do you how do you go? Uh, I guess. When you start thinking of these stories and, and working it out, what sort of research are you doing? Yeah. Um, or are you just kind of flying by the seat of your pants and then, you know, maybe ask advice of other people <laughs> during editing? Kind of what's your process for a, for tackling a subject that you are not intimately familiar with? Right. Well, I know, I'm sure you agree. Everybody, I think every author has his or her own version of what kind of research has to be done. I know Lisa Gardner, right. uh, who's a friend of mine, she she will research something literally to the very nth degree before she begins. And Harlan Coben, who's also a friend, doesn't research a dang thing. He just, you know, he just flies by the seat of his pants and then he, um, you know, and I don't know if he still works that way, but it's been a while since we talked about it, but that he was always like, ah, research is overrated, which is a totally Harlan thing to say anyway. But um, I'm in somewhere in the middle for sure. I've been lucky enough that when I was in finance, um, at, you know, for the, for most of that time, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, I had um, access to the police. They were incredibly accommodating. And I'm an absolute huge fan of law enforcement, which is why the protagonists are law enforcement rather than, you know, them being um, the antagonist or the villain or something. I, I think it's an impossible job, um, particularly right, you know, now in today's um, day. And I, I, Re, you know, I reach out, you know, the funny thing is if you reach out to the police's um, press office and say, hey, I'm an author, I'm writing a book where my protagonist, you know, my main character is a police officer, I'd like to learn more. They're really pretty accommodating and they'll do their best to um, help find, help you find somebody who can, you know, who can answer specific questions. I've been um, really lucky that way. And I, 
I have I made in fact with um, Dead Center I made a personal um, really strong connection with a woman whose name is Dolly Casaza, which is such a fabulous name. I never used it in the book because it was actually it. It is a, a great name, right? She was a sex yeah. inspector in San Francisco, um, and she was. I went and met her and um, sat down with her, particularly because here was a woman in sex crimes, which I think is a is a very different you know thing than I'm, I mean, not that sex crimes don't happen to men, of course they do, and it, and it's widely overlooked. But um, but it it was an, I really wanted to understand what it was like to work with largely female victims in in sex crimes, um, and she was incredibly generous with me, and and I could ask questions in the you know middle of the night and I'd hear from her as soon as she was you know up and about so and I still do that I still have people that I can reach out to and um I've made some medical examiner uh, contacts because I I have to I want to know enough that I'm not really um blowing it and I I do take a lot of poetic license I feel like and I know people they sometimes they really hate that I get you know you get reviews or readers are so angry that that wasn't realistic or and that's that's fine but for me it's I, I want to be able to play with the truth because to be honest, if we had to really go by the books, it's so much more paperwork and it's so much slower and it's just not, doesn't make for the exciting story that, you know, that I want to read when I sit down and pick up a book for escapism. Right. Uh, did your, uh, your work and your uh, relationship with Dolly uh, that, that you uh, formed in, in asking her questions, did she inspire uh, some of these strong female characters uh, that are in your books? Oh, they, yes. In fact, every police officer and, um, you know, uh, coroner, all the people that I've met, men and women, they're really, what's amazing about them, I think, is it's, and what I hope to project in the books is the idea that they're both incredibly strong, of course, because their jobs require it but also incredibly human and they show so much empathy um, and it, and it, it, it affects them. It's, you know, it's obviously it's, it's a, these are not robots. Their, their strength is, is an, an exterior that is, has to protect, you know, the victims and the job and also, you know, their families and whatever's underneath that, which is usually an incredibly caring, you know, loving, compassionate human being. And that's, um, that's inspirational always. And I, I find, you know, I read stories, I often speak out stories about, you know, police officers and the un, you know, unsuspecting heroes or the, you know, the, un, the unthanked heroes. And it, it is inspiring for sure. The strength there is incredible. Well, I would imagine that not many of them uh, get into law enforcement for the great pay uh, in the <laughs> right. beginning. So I, I, like I, I would hope that <laughs> right. I would hope there's a, a, a deep rooted empathy in there somewhere, you know, that I, uh, I really uh, believe there is. I, I mean, I know there's there's obviously the there's a there are the bad seeds in any any job. Um, of course. But I think they're in writing, too. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. And uh, we have our share of them, no doubt. But I mean, I think sure. um, I think for sure it seems the the majority that I have met, in fact, I haven't met really one of the, the bad Apple ones. I've only met the the wonderfully generous, um, compassionate ones. So I've been really lucky. And and um, I'm so grateful because I, I think it's hard to do this job without being able to access the people who do it for real. Um, yeah. Cause I, well, and I think, the good guys you know, don't wind up on the – the good guys don't wind up on the six o'clock news, you know. No, they, you right. only see the bad ones, you know. No, that's true. So. I know that that takes us to the whole press story, right? Um, but yes, um, the press is not like the good guys. It's much more fun to talk about the bad guys, so. Right, right, right. Uh, in when did, at what point uh, did you realize uh, after publishing that first book and then? Uh, maybe following up with the second, uh, at what point did you realize that, uh, okay, I think I'm onto something and I think this is something that I can do and that I'm good at, uh, or, you know, when you sold that first book, did, were you just, you know, committed to the end? Uh, was there ever a moment where you realized, okay, I'm, I'm a real author now? Do you know, I, Hank, I honestly feel like that's happened like in the last six months. <laughs> 
Um, really? Until that time, I always did something else. So, and I have two kids, so that you know, I still do that. Of course, they don't. Oh, they sure. don't. Uh, they're not moved out yet. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure when they move out, I'll still be doing it. But, um, but no, I, I, I was a, you know, I spent those years in finance, and I wrote um, my first four books while I was working in finance, um, and then, or so, I mean, I actually wrote my first seven books. So there's the three buried in the backyard, and then the four that published, and then. Um, I wrote my the first book of the Rookie Club while I was actually um, doing some more freelance work, marketing, writing, um, so that I had a little more flexibility, particularly because of the kids. Uh, but I done that. I did that literally until through last year. Um, and 2016 was the year that I really wrote more than I worked, um, and that's new because I I think for. For me, it it felt like it was always a little, and it still is, of course, obviously, as you know, it's a very in, unsure business. It's very uncertain. You're only as good as your latest book. Um, but I guess I finally felt like, okay, I'm 10 books in. I have published with, you know, traditional publishers. I've, I've published on my own. Um, I know enough of what I'm doing and what I'm capable of that if I can do it full time, I can do hopefully more of it. Now, you know, I'm hoping... I have an, a book that I'm writing that's not related to the series. I I just turned in Excise, which is going to be book two of Dr. Schwartzman's series, and it's out in August. And um, I got the two thumbs up from my editor, which is great. So we're going to you know do some work on that, of course. Um, but that one is set aside now, and I'm working on a standalone um, for a few months, and then I will go and work on book three of the Schwartzman series, um, assuming my publisher wants it, which I'm I'm hoping they will. But uh, so I'm hoping to be able to write kind of more than a book a year, and I'm not going to commit to two books a year. But you know, I never could do more than really a book a year. It was really a lot. You know, when when you're doing something else, I'm sure you know. Um, I'm sure you you know the same feeling. It's and it's but it's hard to give up your day job because you know you just never know. And um, and we're not. I mean, we're sort of like police officers. We're not that well paid for all the effort. Um, at least most of us, right? So yeah. you, it, yeah. it's a it's a labor of love for sure. Um, so yeah, I guess I feel like I'm a real writer now. And I, before now, I've had moments of being like, oh, I'm I'm in it for the long haul. And I, I, you know, I've had moments where I thought, no, this is it's too hard. It's too, it takes too much of me, um, to have it be, you know so hard so i don't will i go back to that i'm hoping not gosh you'd think at some point you'd have you know critical <laughs> mass behind you i'm not sure i'm going to say optimistic and say i'm i'm in i'm in for the long haul i hope to do this in time Ooh. got dementia uh, absolutely and and uh i'm i hope that you pick up a lot of new fans today from the show oh, uh, because uh, I, I, i'm sure fun. one okay so, well yeah thank you. Uh, well you're welcome uh, thank you for writing such great books uh, let's talk a little bit about your process for just a minute. Um, so with your, your books are, are very detailed and you have these great plots, uh, that string you along and keep you turning pages. Uh, are you a, a, a plotter? Are you a pantser or are you somewhere in the middle? I'm not a pantser. Um, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a plotter for sure. Um, Sort of a little bit like, you know, they talk about the fog lights, you know, kind of enough, to, you know, driving in the fog, you know, enough ahead of you to know kind of what two steps forward, but not that much further. I probably am a right. little bit more like not quite deep fog, but so I know, like, I always have a sense of like sort of where the book ends. I know kind of who, who I'm aiming towards, who did it and, and why. And sometimes I have an idea about how that shakedown happens you know what what is that last piece clicks with you know the the detective inspector or whomever that think that makes it all open and clear to them as to what happened um but then there's this black space between that ending part and where i am and i if i'm if i know the next so if i know the next few steps the next what it might look like what might be a red herring what they might pursue that may turn out to be something or might not or then I'm okay. If I don't, I kind of sit and stare out the window because I don't not you know I don't ever feel like I could sit down and just write something that I don't know at all where it's going to go. Um, 
I have to ha- I have to know enough. But you know what's interesting, and, and and then you may work the same way. I'm not, you know, you'll have to let us know. But I, I, I used to write w- really linearly. I used to write sort of start. I mean, having an idea what the finish was. I never wrote the finish until I got there. And recently, like in the last two books or three books, I've written a little bit more out of sequence. Like I, I might have a scene that I know kind of comes somewhere along that black stretch of road, but I'm not exactly sure where. And I can write it. And I use Scrivener now. I used to use Word. Yes. And Scrivener, I don't know, if, audience, if we've got writers, you got to check it out because it's oh yeah, it's so brilliant. Um, and I love it because you can drag and drop those chapters or scenes or whatever you've got everywhere, every which way, and then you can storyboard. And I don't use nearly enough of the incredible features that it has, but I the ability nobody to, does. Yeah, I know the ability. Just, but you find the few that that work for you, right? To, to say, just say yeah. chapter something, you know, chapter question mark, and throw it in there. It also kind of frees me up to not feel so stuck. You know, if I'm like, oh, I don't really know what's happening next, but I, I can write something that I know is happening down the line. Now, sometimes those pieces don't end up in the final story, but that's okay, too. You know, I think um, my out files are oftentimes, you know, you know, at least half as big as the final book, you know, that the stuff that doesn't quite work in the end um so that i love that and so that is for me the long answer <laughs> on how I, yeah. my process is these days I, I i use scrivener as well and i have for a couple of years now and uh the the idea of outlining always intimidated me because i hated that part of school and right. always you know right. i always thought back to that uh, but what Scrivener does for me is allows me to create a whole list of folders, and then I just name those folders with little plot points or you know character little exactly. pieces of the character arc, and and I just kind of write those ideas down in in folder uh, you know titles, and then when you step back from it, that's an outline. That's exactly. your roadmap for your book, and exactly. it's so painless and so uh, free, and it's just it's fantastic. It it allows uh, those of us that don't think that way to to think that way. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. It really it's it's helped me a lot too, um, and I think it does make it more efficient yeah. um, process for me, which is nice because I'm not a super super fast writer. But I mean, um, if I have the ideas, then I can you know it happens more quickly. That's true for everybody, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I was talking to Doug Richards uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and I was asking him about uh, you know. Um, when you're when you're writing a book with an intricate plot, you know, making sure that you're foreshadowing and and uh, that ev- all the little pieces are in place uh, mm-hmm. to get your story where it needs to go. And and he said, well, we have this wonderful tool now uh, that allows us to time travel, and uh, it's called a word processor. And <laughs> later in the book, when you think, oh, I wish I would have you know hinted at this earlier, you can just go back to that little file in Scrivener and and plug it in there. Exactly. You know, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I keep a list of things a, I think I need to follow up on, you know, as I'm writing like, oh, don't forget you planted this, you know, or you mentioned they would follow up on this evidence or you, you know, just because, you know, in a hundred thousand words or it's, you can, you lose track of a lot of things. So that kind of helps me. And I, that's something else I've just done more recently is it, and I use Scrivener for that, just a list of like, you know, um, and oftentimes it's because I say, oh yeah, so and so follow up on at, find out if this and then I forget that I asked somebody to do that you know and they don't come back and remind me so I have to have a list right uh, so your your first books were published traditionally uh, yes. through Penguin and then uh, you went to self publishing and now you're with Thomas and Mercer what has that uh, <laughs> sort of publishing trajectory uh, been like for you and. Well- and okay. were you were you at first hesitant to self publish? Oh gosh. Well so it's funny, you know, um the you know, it's been I I am a I would have been a traditional person had it worked out that way. I think um, you know, I, w- I grew up kind of with people like Lisa Gardner and she published her first book just a couple years before I pub or first I should say her first suspense book, about a couple years before I published mine and I thought for sure I would go along that road. Um and, you know, for, you know, obviously things don't always work the way you plan. It's a good lesson for life. Um, it was the reason, you know, when I left Penguin Putnam, I wasn't immediately inspired to go and write the next Rookie Club book. I kind of thought, oh, 
Um, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Um, I actually got my MFA in between those two things. So in 2006, my, the rookie club came out at the center, um, and I went back and spent two years getting an MFA, which was an incredible experience. Um, I'm so grateful. It was, you know, as I mentioned before, I kind of, my upbringing was practical. Writing was not a real job. So to get a degree in it would have been sort of silly. So I, that was a time to really explore what I wanted to write, you know, in an environment that was really supportive. I was a little nervous being a genre writer in an MFA program, you know, already published as a writer. Um, but I went to Qu- Queen's right. University, which is a low residency program. You spend, I spent um, 10 days twice a year in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the rest of it I, you do dis- at distance so I could be, you know, where my family is. Um, and I had, my first professor there was Elizabeth Strout, you know, the Pulitzer Prize winner of all of Kittredge. Um, and it was, I mean, really just a phenomenal time. The people that I met, the teachers that I had um, really helped me grow my craft and uh, understand what I wanted to do. I was able to, to just, you know, I was always a plot person. I was always really mm-hmm. good with plot. But I think I learned so much about the power of language, how different people speak and how we hear that on the page, um, how we can really, I mean, you know, they say, sh- you know, show, don't tell, but I, I I understood the idea, but I didn't really understand how to do it the way I do. feel like I do now. It was just, it was wonderful. So that was kind of this gift I gave to myself or that my husband and I gave to me. Um, and, um, and then I came back and thought, okay, you know, my husband was always looking at, he was always reading about the e-publishing. He was always pulling articles out of the, the, the business times and the New York times and everything to say, look at what's happening in this business. You should, get your rights to your first five books back um, and think about, you know, doing something with them. And, you know, he will flex his arm muscles and tell us how awesome he is because it was really his idea. And I finally, after some (laughs) poking and prodding, did that. And I did get the rights back, which was really lucky because I think Penguin Putnam probably saw that a few years had passed and I hadn't done anything with them and they assumed I wasn't ever going to write another book. Um, So they gave them up to me, you know, quite nicely. And then I went and wrote those, you know, other four rookie cup books kind of, um, after my MFA. And that was really, it was fun. It was, you know, I didn't see that there was a way to take those traditionally. And I, a lot of friends were trying uh, self-publishing and, and having success. I had a friend that was really, kidding. One of the I really, really don't like is this promotion. I'm just, I really want to be in the basement with the characters. I don't want to be peddling the books. And as you know, that's, that's a huge part of this business. And, and really, for me, the hardest part of being self-published. Um, but I was able to find yes. a partnership with a, a company that helped me do that. And that way, I didn't really have to peddle them. Um, and that went really well. And then, you know, I decided I was going to write, start a new series. And at that point, I went back, actually, um, to the agent I had wanted to work with. And it was funny. It was literally 20 years from the time she rejected me when I had that first book written the first book that sold written and when she took me on her name is Meg Ruley and she's a superstar I feel like I I've got the you know Rolls Royce of agents and she took me to the Mercer and they have been phenomenal I mean it's I don't know if it's you know the world of publishing now um but they have been I mean I got you know they congratulate you on your sales and they sold a present and I mean I don't know it feels like um I won the lottery so I'm really I'm super happy and I have no intention of, you know, I hope it'll stay this way because I, I love being there and I love who I'm working with. My editor, editor there is amazing. And so I'm super, um, I'm in a great spot, but it was a circuitous route, no doubt. Um, but I think it is, I think 99.9% of us, um, I'm, you know, and I know this is true for you too. It's not, there's nothing straight and linear about, how this business goes you kinda oh, gotta, for sure yeah you kind of yeah. got to be willing to ride the ride the roller coaster yeah and i am uh i'm pretty publishing agnostic uh yeah. th- i think we're in a great time right now where authors have freedom uh and that's what i appreciate the most uh if you think that traditional publishing is the best route for you then you have that option. If you think self-publishing is the best route for you, you have that option. If you think some hybrid company is the best, 
you have that option. We, yes. we never have had the options that we have today. And, oh, no. uh, yeah. and, and yeah, there, there are some, some, you know, crazy things that have happened in traditional publishing and, uh, that have not been good for authors. Uh, you know, but there's been other things that have not been good for authors with self publishing in the past. I, I think we're getting to a good place where, uh, we don't have to argue about it. Just, you know, if that is what's, what worked for you, then more power to you. Yeah, and I feel like I have friends now published by some of the smaller presses, and that's, you know, it, you know, there were smaller presses back in the day, and then they all got combined into the, you know, jumbo companies, and now there's small presses again. I, I do feel like it's a, it's a really good time to be an author. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm really grateful, and I'm grateful for the experience of it being not a straight road. I mean, I think it's a lesson, you know, certainly from, my children to see, right? I mean, this is not, this is a, if you're not stubborn and you're not really, really stubborn, you're just not going to make it because you have to believe that you can do it and you have to want it a lot. And I think that's, you know, there's, that's true of most things worth having in life. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good lesson for all of us that if you love something, you don't quit it. You just, yeah. Right. You know, you ride the downs with the ups and that's it's part of the way things go. So, yeah. Um I want to ask uh, about your MFA uh real quick. Yeah. You um a lot of people will tell you uh, especially if you want to be a genre writer, uh don't get an MFA because you'll wind up just writing for writers and you know you'll you'll wind up with a lot of navel gazing and a lot of pretentious <laughs> prose um but you but and and i i don't know that i agree with that or not that's just you know things i've heard sure. uh other people say but uh you you approached it completely differently you were already a published successful author you already had uh this uh, sort of style and, and things that were settled and ingrained in you. Uh, and then, uh, it, it sounds to me like you went back to, uh, you know, to add more tools to your toolkit. Uh, is that something that you would recommend for other people to do? And would you recommend, uh, them do it like you did and get some writing experience first, uh, and then go that route? Or would you recommend a young person go straight for an MFA in college? Well, gosh, you know, I mean, and that's um, and that's a long winding question. Yeah, I know. I, know. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, obviously, I think it's an, you can't. I I wouldn't even pretend to tell somebody else how to do it. Um, and I probably, I mean, it was a weird way to do it. I think I and I know it was an anomaly at Queens um, because you know it was I was the only student that had been published before she started, at least as of the time I was there. Um, and, you know, there, for, certainly when I got the phone call from the director of the school, Fred Lebron, he said, you know, you're already published. What, you know, why, you know, why do you want to get your MFA? And it was a valid, you know, it was a really valid question. And he was an incredible teacher and a, and a mentor for me during the program as well. Um, I just wasn't sure. I was sort of, it was, you know, it was really a, a sort of renaissance because I didn't really know what I was doing as a writer at that time. I mean, I knew I loved defense and I knew that was where I sort of, where I felt like I, I fit naturally, but I didn't know if that was the only thing I was going to write. And I, I sort of was curious about trying something that was more literary. And largely, I think from the process of writing what was a more literary book, I rediscovered that I really am, I really do love the genre. I mean, I, it wasn't really that literary, but what I ended up writing was really a, you know, a genre book with a more literary style and it didn't work i mean i think that's what you expect the first time anyway as we know but um but i i mean for the large majority of um the people that i ran into the professors in particular that i worked with at queens and that i met down there were very accepting of like you're i'm a non-traditional student if you will right i'm I'm coming to a writing course. I'm already a published author, and I'm a genre author, author which is not a, a common in an MFA world. But there were others of us wanting to write genre. Um, and I think, you know, I think the world of MFAs is very different than it was when, you know, you either went to Iowa or nowhere, and you were going to be Elizabeth Stout. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, she's, you know, the wonderful thing about about her was her, you know, she's obviously an incredible literary author, but her ability to accept me for what I was trying to do and help me get better at that 
um, and not make me into, you know, a navel gazer, you know, but it's, you know, it's a, test, <laughs> it a testament in terms of teaching. And that was true for, you know, working with Fred Lebron and, um, you know, some other teachers I had there. Now, um, um, and I think, you know, the nice thing about a program like that is they, the, the, like Fred, his job is to match you with somebody who will, you will, will work with, who will work with you. So it would have been clear of people and would have just had absolute distaste for the kind of thing I was writing. And there would be, there are those people right. for sure who were, who were really, they were, you know, they had the, and I, I found it more amongst the students than amongst the teachers that there was this sort of like, mm. what are you doing here? You're a genre writer. And that's, you know, again, it's sort of the stubborn, thick skinness. You have to be like, fine. You know, you know, you don't, you don't want to read what I'm writing. That's, you know, that that's fine. I don't, you know, and I didn't always particularly want to read what they were writing. You know, it's that's a style thing. I'm glad. You know, it'd be hard to be a teacher because you have to be way more accepting. But, but even the people who didn't love my writing, you know, you find commonality because you're all writers. So as far as telling other people to do it, I think it was amazing. I'm really grateful I did it. I'm grateful I did it 10 years into my writing career because I feel like, you know, there's a lot you can learn from. And I think everybody should be reading, you know, books like On Writing by Stephen King and Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott and all the books by, um, uh, you know, um, oh gosh, um, Key, um, Robert Key, is that right? All the, like, mm-hmm. blockbuster, how to write a blockbuster and the story by Robert McKee, all those books, everybody should, you know, everybody who wants to be a writer should just, like, devour any book about writing, read it, ingest it, take notes, and then throw them away. You know, it's sort of like you just have to <laughs> listen to what resonates and what stays with you is the stuff that matters, you know? You can't follow yeah. everybody's rules because everybody's rules are, you know, be everything, everything's a contradiction. So, um but I, I definitely was, it's a very, I mean, it's an expensive proposition to get an MFA. So, sure. you know, and I, I wouldn't do it without really, you know, I wouldn't do it probably without knowing 110% that it's what you want to do. And then I don't think it hurts, you know. I think everything yeah. you do helps. Well, I'm a big fan, uh, usually after the fact, uh, <laughs> of putting yourself in uncomfortable positions that make you stretch and uh look at things differently you know um and it sounds like that that would be a great way uh you know when you've surrounded yourself with other genre writers to then um you know let some other people kind of pick at what you do and and see how that makes you grow exactly absolutely and i think you know you have to as long as you feel like it's going to be a like a i mean i think it's you have you have to go in it knowing that there are going to be critics and some of them will be not so kind, you know, particularly, particularly like I yeah. said, the students, because you, you read each other's work as well as the, the teachers reading your work. But the teachers re- keep it in a pretty positive environment. You know, that's part of their job is to not let anybody. And you've always got the people who, you know, the, I mean, in any place, like we talked about earlier, you've got the people who know everything, right? They're, they know exactly how you should do it and why what you're doing is wrong. And they're never the teachers. <laughs> they're always somebody right. else. So if you, you know, if you can keep that in check and not be brought down by it, then that's, you know, that's, it's a, any, like you said, any, any uncomfortable situation is a learning experience. Absolutely. Um, your new series is, uh, is the Dr. Schwartzman series. Uh, how, um, when you've had a, uh, a great uh, running series, the, the the rookie club series that you had, uh, and you've got these established characters, and I would imagine uh, that after several books, it starts to get uh, more comfortable to ease back into that world and start a new book, uh, because you've got some set pieces that are already in place that you can uh, work with. Uh, what is it like spinning that off to a new series, and uh, is it like getting a new start, uh, or is it... Uh, is it is it hard work to uh, to shift gears like that? Um, well, you know, and I, I'm not necessarily done with the Rookie Club series. I mean, people have asked me, you know, um, they ask that question, and, and it's not like it ended. Um, but I, you know, I wrote this secondary character in Everything to Lose, Ash Schwartzman, um, and I just thought she just really sort of spoke to me. And I think when a character does that and she has a story, you know, it, it's our job as authors to listen. And so I thought, you know, she wants some time. So I basically 
thought, okay, I'm going to give her her own her own time. And I, I started to zoom with the idea that it would be, you know, maybe a three book series or, you know, trilogy. Um, and now, to be honest with you, I've just written, I've, you know, just finished book two. And I I think it'll be, she's got more. There's The, the arc is longer and the story with her um, ex, um, estranged, terrible husband is, um, there's more there. So we have, um, I don't know, four, maybe five, maybe longer. So I, it's, it's work, it's both, it's work and it's fun. Um, a new character for me is really exciting. There's a lot to learn and particularly this is different because she's not a police officer. So the whole world of medical examiners and medicine in general is a, there's a lot to learn and I have to reach out and rely on a lot of people, new people, you know, about just getting my, because obviously a medical examiner has been to medical school, <laughs> which I have not. Um, so I have to rely on people just about, you know, I need to make sure my anatomy is right. And I'm, um, and then all the procedural stuff is brand new. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a steep learning curve. Again, I'm really grateful because I've, I have access to some medical examiner and coroner folks who've been helpful and I I'm always looking for new resources so if there's you know there's somebody who crops into my FFI fan who wrote writes me and says oh I was a coroner I'm always like okay yeah I have you do you mind if I ask questions sometimes because you know you, you know I've got people are really busy so if I find somebody who's willing to answer a question here and there I'm so grateful because you know you, you can't just call a medical examiner on the phone and say, listen, I got a <laughs> question. Could you, you know, could you answer? She's got a lot of stuff going on. So, so yeah. It's, it's yeah. So, you probably get some strange looks. Uh, I know. Like, right. Yeah. Exactly. I do. I do for sure. That's great. Uh, your, your latest book out is called Zoom, uh, the Dr. Schwartzman series book one. It's available now on Amazon. Uh, book two, uh, like you said, is in the works. Uh, when will we see book two? Uh, do you think? Yeah. Book two is out August 22nd. Okay, great, great. Yeah, and I want to tell my listeners uh, that there's uh, the audio book for Exhum uh, is available on Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash Hank, uh, you can get that book for free uh, from Audible. So go pick that up. I listened to the audio book of Exhum. It is fantastic. Uh, so uh, go Thank pick that you. up and you get a free copy of it. Yeah. That was um, fun. She was fun to get to pick it. That's my first audio book, and it was fun to get to pick a reader. I mean, so I had a reader who had, was able to, you know, she's from um, South Carolina, so she could do the accents, you know, because of course I, Annabelle has some accents. She's she lived in, you know, other places for long enough. But um, but um, Harper Leeton, who is the main detective in Charleston, she has obviously a very a very southern accent. So that was fun to listen to um, to the reader. She did a really good job. I thought I was pleased. Oh yeah, it's awesome working with uh, uh, with with voice actors on uh, on on narration uh, because you can uh, if 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 the readers out there aren't familiar with with how uh, some of that process works, you can uh, if you have a book and you want to make an audio book, you can go to ACX and uh, you can put up auditions and people and you can put specifics in there that you're looking for and and people will send auditions and you can reply back and say ah. Uh, that's too southern. Uh, you know, if you're if you're really from the south, we we don't really talk that way. That only happens in movies. And and right. they'll dial that down, you know, and send another one. And and it's a it's an awesome process to to hear your book come to life and to hear other people's interpretations of it. It's really fun. It really is fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, Danielle, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, this time we've had to talk. Oh, me too, Hank. It was really a pleasure, and I, I really, I really appreciate it. And um, you know, if I can offer uh, a couple free copies of the heart, you know, the paperback to people, and get those to you, I'd love to do that. To uh, um, so some people can, yeah. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Uh, if you would like uh, to take Danielle up on that offer for a free uh, paperback, leave a comment in the show notes. Uh, with, uh, and, and tell us that you listen to the show and next week we'll draw a couple of winners and, uh, and we'll get Danielle to, uh, to send those to you. I would love it. And I'm happy, happy to sign it. So you let me know if you'd like it, uh, who you'd like it made out to. Hank, you, um, get in touch with me and we'll give out three copies if you'd like. That'd be fun. 
You got it. Sounds great. Uh, Daniel, tell everyone where they can connect with you and, uh, and, uh, follow your work and, uh, and follow your, your news of what's coming up next. Yes. I, um, my website's probably the best spot, DanielleGerard.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, um, quite a bit as author Danielle Gerard. Um, and I'm on Twitter once in a while. I'm not much of a tweeter. Um, so please, I'd love to hear from, from readers. And I, I also respond to, um, email pretty readily so you can get my email address off of my um, contact on my website too thanks again Hank so much thank you thanks for listening to the author stories podcast join me each Tuesday and Friday at hankgarner.com for a new episode thanks for listening